Okay, so today I'm going to discuss the axioms for the projective plane. Now, before I do that, let me uh, give two extra definitions. So, recall last time that I discussed the idea of perspectivity. Um, and in particular, we'd say, for example, if we have a line with three points on it, and another line with three points on it. Then we'd say that these three points or this line would be perspective to this line with respect to this point. Now, actually though, if we're only interested in these points, we could say that this set of three points here is perspective to this set of three points here with respect to this point here. Um, and we can generalize this concept. So we can generalize this idea of having a set of points being projected to another set of points via a set of points, meaning that those two sets can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence in such a way that corresponding points uh, have a line linking them which goes through this perspectivity point here, this kind of viewing point. So let's just formalize that. So two sets of points are perspective to one another. with respect to a point P so sometimes P is called the center of perspectivity when the sets can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence so that any two corresponding points are joined by a line through P. So in a sense the sort of pencil of point P acts as a kind of bridge between one of these sets of points and the other. Now we can give the dual definition of this um, just replacing lines with points and points with lines. Um, so we say that two sets of lines
our perspective. With respect to a line L, when they can be put into one to one. correspondence so that two corresponding lines meet at a common point on the line L. That should be that any any two corresponding lines have that property. Okay? So there we go, that's the dual definition. Now um, one last thing to tell you before we set down the axioms is de Zarg's theorem. And this is actually one of the most fundamental results in projective geometry. So what it says, it says that if two triangles or let's say if the vertices from two triangles are perspective from a point or with respect to a point, then the lines of the two triangles will be perspective from a line. So then these triangles will be perspective from a line okay so de Zarg, uh, was working on this um, as he was thinking about how to extend techniques of projective drawing and things into a mathematical theory round about the same time that Descartes was um, discussing his ideas for using coordinates in geometry and just history happened to go the way that uh, Descartes geometric geometric ideas were very well accepted um, and de Zarg at, at his time I think he was kind of ahead of his time and many of his results were largely ignored by most of the mathematicians of his day but more and more recently we're discovering how useful these um, projective geometry notions are which he defined and uh, developed and this is one of his central results so let's take a look at de Zarg's theorem We'll start with this point, this kind of viewing point. 
and we'll draw some rays coming from it. Now let's draw some triangles. So here's our first triangle. And here's our second triangle. So hopefully you can see that the vertex set of this triangle here um, is perspective to the vertex set of this triangle here with respect to this point here. Now what that really means is that corresponding vertices of the triangle are linked by these lines which are members of a pencil of this kind of viewing point or centre of perspectivity. And what does Arg's theorem says then is it says that the set of edges of this triangle is going to be perspective to a set of edges of this triangle with respect to a line. So if we extend out these corresponding edges, for example, this edge corresponds with this edge. So let's extend them and see where they meet. Okay, so there's three pairs of edges. The first pair of edges meet here. The second pair of edges meet there. And the third pair of edges meet there. Now, the remarkable claim of de Zarg's theorem is that those three points one, two, three, where those corresponding edge pairs meet, are going to be collinear. They're going to lie on a specific line. And we can see this is true. So it's a very interesting idea. I thoroughly recommend that you play around with this, try different kinds of configurations of the triangles. For example, you could have one triangle inside the other, the viewing point could be inside the triangle. It really doesn't matter how you draw the thing. 
Dezarg's theorem will always hold true. Now, what about the proof? Well, I did another video which gives the proof of Dezarg's theorem from the vantage point of three-dimensional projective space. See, it turns out that if you imagine we're working in 3D space instead of 2D space, you can prove this quite easily. However, in the framework which we're going to use, we're actually going to take Desargues um, theorem as a axiom. So this is basically going to be one of our axioms. It's probably one of the most complicated axioms that if two triangles are perspective from a point, then those two triangles will be perspective from a line. Okay then, so now it's finally time to write down the six axioms for the projective plane. These are the axioms according to Coexeter. These are the ones he uses in his book. So axiom number one. Each pair of distinct points are joined by a unique line. That's extremely natural. Axiom number two. Okay, so this one is a bit less natural in a way. So what it says is that any two lines are going to meet at at least one point. In fact, later we can show that they're going to meet at exactly one unique point if they're distinct lines. But um, anyway, for now, we say that they're going to meet at at least one point. Now, this is um, contrary to the parallel postulate of Euclid. Um, because Euclid says that parallel lines don't meet. But we say that every pair of lines meet. And in particular, parallel, what well, so-called parallel lines... We shall think of those as meeting at infinity, but we don't have to go into details about that because we're just laying down axioms here. And these axioms will um, hold for some, for geom geometry like on the Euclidean plane, but also for geometry in some very different strange kind of spaces. Um, all we have to do is think about the axioms. So the next one then, 
is there exists four points, at least four points, four distinct points, no three of which are collinear. Remember, we say that three points are collinear when they all lie on the same line. Okay then. So, the next one's a little bit complicated. So, if you recall our discussion of the complete quadrangle, um, basically this next one says that the diagonal points of the complete quadrangle and never Collinear. So we can speak of the diagonal triangle uh, associated with a quadrangle um, because these three important points it generates are never going to be in a straight line. In fact, we can consider systems where this axiom does not hold, and I shall discuss something like that later. Okay, axiom number five is de Zarg's theorem. If two triangles are perspective from a point, then they're perspective from a line. Now, finally, axiom number six is about projectivities. And in particular, it's about how if uh, enough points on a line are fixed under a projectivity, that projectivity is going to fix all the points on the line. So it's about when we have kind of fixed points, if you like. So in particular, it says that if a projectivity leaves three distinct points in variant which are on a line L, then it leaves every point on L invariant. Okay, so what this is basically saying is that if you've got some line
and you do some perspect some projectivity and it ends up mapping this point back to itself this point back to itself and this point back to itself well in that case it must necessarily map all the other points on that line back to themselves so there we have it these are our six axioms from these six axioms we can infer all the things we're interested in about the projective plane so one nice thing we can do now before we squeeze too much information out of these axioms is to demonstrate the kind of duality that we have in these systems between lines and points so in particular um, there's a kind of dual of each of these axioms which is a theorem which can be proved using these axioms um, where the ideas of points and lines are kind of flipped round. So in particular, I'll call it one bar. It says that each pair of distinct lines meter to unique point so that kind of augments or maybe even replaces this uh, number two here so remember these from now on okay let's just be very clear these things here these are axioms these are things we're just going to suppose in order to start off our theory and from here on down we're talking about theorems things you can prove using the axioms So next we have this theorem that for any two points there's going to be at least one joining them 
sorry, for any two points, there's going to be at least one line joining them. In fact, for distinct points, there's going to be exactly one line joining them, but we don't have to say that. Also, we have that there exists four lines, at least. No three of which are concurrent. Essentially, these, these uh, statements, three and three bar, allow us to kick off our discussions of the quadrangles and quadrilaterals. So next we have the kind of dual of statement four, which says that the diagonal lines of a complete quadrilateral and never concurrent. So once again we never have this case where these three special lines generated from the quadrilateral uh, meet at a point. They're always distinct. Um, and again this is part of why we're allowed to talk of the diagonal triangle of both the structure from four points, the quadrangle, and the structure we get from four lines, the quadrilateral. Uh, statement number five, the theorem number five, or five bar, sorry, theorem five bar, is the dual to de Zargs theorem or the converse of de Zargs theorem and that states that if two triangles are perspective from a line, then they are perspective from a point. So this is very interesting. De Zarg's theorem, which is essentially this, cannot be proven from inside the projective plane in this axiomatic system. Uh, you have to go into 3D space to prove it, but once you've proved de Zarg's theorem, you can prove the converse of de Zarg's theorem quite easily. Um, and actually when you do so, it reveals a very interesting thing called the de Zarg configuration. Um, which is a very interesting mathematical object in its own right. We'll discuss that in a, in a minute or two. So finally, we have the dual of statement six.
Okay, so what this one says is that if we have three concurrent lines and we have some projectivity which leaves these lines in variance, and when I say it leaves them in variance, it doesn't have to be the case that every single point is on a given line is mapped to itself. It just has to be that the set of all points on this line is mapped onto the set of all points on this line by the projectivity. Anyway, if this occurs, then for three lines through this point, then it will also be true for any other lines through this point. That's what statement six says. Now, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you to prove these theorems. They sort of follow quite naturally, logically, from these axioms. A theorem 5 bar I shall show you the proof of. But hopefully you can see from this that we do have this complete duality in the kind of assumptions of our system. So we have a we have points and we have lines. And when we talk about joining lines sorry, joining points, that's kind of equivalent to talking about meeting lines. When we talk about the range, sorry, when we talk about the pencil of a point, that's kind of equivalent to talking about the range of a line. And so, Basically, you can take any theorem from our projective geometry and make all these replacements to find the kind of dual statements of that theorem. And so, like in a sense, um, points and lines are logically kind of the same thing. Um, they're kind of uh, objects which have the same qualities, which is a very nice feature to have. So now I shall show you the proof to five bar, the converse of de Zarg's theorem. Okay, so Excuse my voice, I'm uh, suffering for a little bit of laryngitis, but it shouldn't prevent me from telling you the idea behind this proof. So, the idea is that we start with a line, uh, this black line, say, and we shall label this line as zero. Now, we're going to assume that we have two triangles which are perspective to this line. One of the triangles has sides A, B, C shown by the red, blue, and dark green lines. So that would be this region up here. And then the other triangle has edges, has sides, sorry, A dash, B dash, C dash, and is therefore this lower region. Now, it should hopefully be clear, by the way I've drawn these, that these two triangles are perspective uh, from this black line. 
because there are these three points on the black line. Um, let's say point one, point two, point three, where A and A dash, B and B dash, and then C and C dash meet respectively. So we have these two triangles, which are perspective with respect to this line. Now, what we want to do to prove the converse of de Zarg's theorem is to then show that it follows that these two triangles will also be perspective from a point. So how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is define a couple of extra lines. One line going from essentially the top vertex of this diagram to the bottom. So that's from AB to A dash B dash. And we'll call that line N. And we'll also define another line called M, which goes from AC to AC dash. So the um, let's just talk about the colors for a second. I've tried to show red, blue and green, use red, blue and green to denote A, B and C and dashes of course to represent things in the second triangle. No dashes for things in the first. And then now we have these two extra lines um, N, which is this purple line connecting the vertex of the top triangle where sides A and B meet with a vertex on the bottom triangle where sides A dash and B dash meet. And we also have this yellow line M linking the sides of the vertex of a top triangle where uh, a and C meet, that's the green and the red side, um, to the vertex of the bottom triangle where A dash and C dash meet. Well, okay then, so what's next? Well, next we have an observation. And that observation is that we can think about some new triangles. In particular, we can think about this triangle, which is kind of using these blue and purple edges. So it's the triangle with sides B, B dash, and N. We can also think about the triangle using the green and yellow edges. So that's this triangle C, C dash, M, the, the, the sides. So I'm describing the triangles in terms of sides rather than vertices. It, it makes more sense for this proof. Um, and now the thing is to notice that both of those triangles are perspective from the point where the lines A and A dash meet. So from this large black point here, the sort of bluey purple triangle and the greeny yellow triangle are perspective from one another. So these two triangles are perspective with one another with respect to this big black point here. And now since we're assuming de Zarg's theorem, um, we have that uh, these two triangles, the blue triangle and green triangle, they must be perspective from a line. Um, in other words, if we extend out the 
cor the sides of these two triangles which correspond to one another um, they're going to make three points in particular this point here NM this point here BC and this point here B dash C dash and they and they must be collinear that's what Desargues theorem tells us as a consequence of this blue and green triangle being perspective from this point is that they're perspective from this line so now we know that these three points are collinear and we can use that to imply our results because if we have a look at this point here at the top this is the point where n meets m and now from the dish definition of n and m you can see that this line has to pass through the uh, vertex AC of our first triangle and the vertex A dash C dash of our second triangle. Also, there's a line through this special point NM which goes through point AB of our first triangle and point A dash B dash of our second triangle. And as we've just been saying, there's also this black line which goes for our special point NM, which passes through point BC of our first triangle and point, well, I mean vertex, you know, point um, B dash C dash of our second triangle. So to cut a long story short, our first and second triangle are both perspective from this point NM. So we started with the assumption that our first and second triangles are perspective from this line O, this black line, this horizontal black line, and we've ended up concluding that they must also be perspective from this point NM. So this is a very interesting diagram. Uh, it shows what's called the Zarg's configuration. So this has 10 points and 10 lines. And notice that there are three lines meeting each point, three different lines. And also each line has three points on it. So it's very special, it has lots of symmetry. It's very interesting to look at it from different sort of perspectives, a bit like an optical illusion. You can, if you want to think of it as a three dimensional thing, you can do that in different ways and see pyramids sticking out in different directions. And, um, you know, it's well worth having a good look at this and thinking about different ways to draw it because really this configuration kind of illustrates in itself lots of the ideas behind Desargues theorem and its converse. So it's important um, to think about projective geometry purely in terms of these axioms. I mean the axioms are developed with a mind to replicate the results we get on the kind of augmented Euclidean plane with infinite points, but they can also be applied to lots of other interesting systems. For example, this is the smallest finite projective plane. So we can have finite projective planes which only have a finite number of points and lines. And this is called the Fano plane. It's a somewhat unusual object.
So it has seven points and seven lines. Accounting the lines, um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We count this circle here as a line. Okay. And this Fano plane, it has th three lines going through every point and three points on every line. It satisfies all of the conditions, all of our axioms except number four. We don't have this case where um, quadrangles have non-collinear diagonal points. In fact, if you get a complete quadrangle, look at the um, three diagonal points it generates. I think they're necessarily going to be lying on a straight line in this case. So that's the only way in which this kind of doesn't full doesn't hold up to all the axioms but that doesn't mean it's not worth studying as i said before the the axioms we chose are not unique it's kind of like making a curry it's like how spicy do you want it how many axioms do you want to put in there how restrictive do you want to be and there are various um kind of levels of strength of projective geometry, if you like, various assumptions you, assumptions you can make. Anyway, so this is the smallest finite projective plane. And um, later on we're going to hopefully have time to look at lots of other finite projective planes. Uh, just note here that these places where the line crosses the circle, there are no points here. The points are only around the outside the triangle and right in the middle. Okay, so I think this Fano plane gives a, a good opportunity to explain a kind of different way of thinking about projective geometry where we really remove the concepts of points and lines altogether so essentially we can because we can just think of points and lines as two different kinds of elements now the neighborhood of a point of a element which is a point is going to be the pencil of that point. In other words, the thing touching an element which is a point is the set of lines that goes through it. And similarly, the neighborhood of a line is going to be its range, the set of line, the set of points touching it. So in this way, we have a kind of what's known as an incidence structure, which basically is nothing more than a network, really, because we have all these elements, some of which are points and some of which are lines, and we can just represent the information as a network within which two elements are joined by a line Hmm. I think I shall say the word arc, just to avoid confusion. Two elements are joined by an arc when they are touching each other. So we can make such a thing for this Fano plane here. In general, when you do this for an incident structure, it's called getting the Levy graph. This was a idea that Levy was thinking about in the 1950s. 
So in particular here, we have, well, let's draw the points on for a start. And now we want to represent this as a graph structure. Graph is just another word for network. So basically these three points here are all sort of um, neighbors of a line, this line, because they belong to the range of this line. So we can represent this line by a white dot and we can draw some arcs to represent how this line is touching. These are the dots. And we can do similar for all the other lines as well. And finally, for this circle, I'll draw it out. I'll draw the correspond the node corresponding to this circular line out here. Unfortunately, my diagram has some overlapping arcs but anyway these are the actual vertices I shall make them clear so the black vertices represent the points and the white vertices represent the lines and in fact it turns out that this structure is actually a famous graph known as the Haywood graph so get a famous finite plane and take the Levy graph of it you might get a famous graph um, all the stuff on this page you don't uh, need to sort of memorize this in, in order to do the rest of this course. Um, we're going to build on the axioms I was discussing before, but this is just a kind of added extra uh, thing which I wanted to discuss as we um, sort of travel across the idea of duality.